Howdy, my name is Karok Ray. I'm the director of the Mays Innovation Research Center and welcome to our talk show, Innovation Matters. The, just to give you background, the Mays Innovation Research Center is an academic center here at Texas A&M University. We're based in the Mays Business School, but we operate campus-wide. We do a lot of different things, such as fund a lot of research among faculty and students. We host conferences, bring speakers to campus, and have events like this. Today, we are very lucky to have Jeremy Osborne uh, here with us today on our talk show, Innovation Matters. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for everything you're doing. This is great. I'm excited. Great. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, let's get into it. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about your life, uh, where you grew up, and how you got to A&M. Okay. Uh, maybe an interesting story, maybe not. <laughs> I'm a Texas native. Uh -huh. I grew up in East Texas, but if you're from East Texas, you'd be mad at me. You, they would insist on calling it Southeast Texas. Uh -huh. Went to a small high school, 76 people in my high school class, and really, you know, first generation Aggie didn't have a lot of uh, affinity for the school early on, but a lot of my friends from high school were coming here, and so that right. helped make the decision. You know, I applied to a lot of places, went and toured a lot of places, and this immediately felt comfortable. It felt like home. It felt like it was big, but from some uh, someone who was coming from a school of yeah. seventy six people in my graduating class, it was yeah. manageable. Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of how I came to be here. Okay. Uh, my parents are small business owners. They've been entrepreneurs. Great. My entire life, my dad started a business a year after I was born. Wow. And for a lot of reasons, he he didn't have a lot of opportunity growing up. Didn't have the you know the best sort of family life situation. And so when he became an adult, he kind of had to forge his own path. Right. That was entrepreneurship for him. Uh -huh. And so I watched it and said, I don't want to do that <laughs> because you know <laughs> it it has its you know it, its joys but its pitfalls yeah, as well. It can yeah. be very challenging. So. In, in my life story, I think what you're going to see is someone who was sort of a natural entrepreneur who resisted it and tried to forge a very traditional career path the entire time uh -huh. I was in school and then early on. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's sort of how I came to be at A&M. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and then you, when you arrived here, tell us what you studied and what you were uh, excited about. What were the I important influences on your life and your sure. career? Uh, in high school, I had a couple of teachers. Yeah. Uh, one, Jana McCatherine, who really encouraged me. She saw something early on. She said, you need to be an attorney. You need to go to law school. Uh -huh. Something she had thought about and hadn't done and yeah. pushed students she liked to, to go do that. And I had a government teacher in high school named Dee Turner. And she as well said, you need to be involved in civic affairs. You need to go to law school. You, you, we need people like you. And, and I didn't really get that at 17 or 18. Yeah. But it was an interesting time. Uh, the Clinton impeachment was going on when I was uh -huh, in high school. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We had the 2000 election and, uh -huh. and all the aftermath. And so it was sort of politics were top of mind for a lot of people. Right. I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the idea of rule of law and that we are a society that, that is governed by law. We submit to it. We settle our disputes at the ballot box and uh -huh. with court rulings. And so that kind of that, that stuck with me. I knew I wanted to do that. I thought I wanted to maybe be in politics. And so I yeah. studied political science and journalism when I was here at a and Okay, okay, great. And you went straight to law school? I did. Yeah. Uh, when you, in the mid-2000s, sort of graduating with a journalism degree, there weren't a lot of options. You know, everything was changing, digital online formats right. had sort of wrecked newspapers nationwide. Right. And I said, I, if I'm gonna do it, now's the time. Mm -hmm. So may maybe that's one takeaway is, if you think you wanna do something, don't wait, go ahead and do it. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. I worked with, or I went to school with people who had some work experience yeah. and, and those who didn't. I didn't see a huge difference really in sort of their career trajectories or their success in law school. Right. So I don't know that it's essential, but that, Maybe for some who had a, a more, a longer span of working in, in D.C., maybe at an agency or something, that was very uh, attractive to prospective firms. But otherwise, I think if you want to go to law school, you should just go straight in. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about your time in Georgetown. How was that? It was incredibly intimidating uh -huh. at first. You, you arrive, I remember the first class, I sat down and the guy next to me had gone to Dartmouth under, undergrad and yeah. this guy had gone to Princeton. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Georgetown was a big feeder for so the Ivies right. that don't have law schools. Right. And they, they, everyone wants to go to Washington, everyone's really ambitious, they think they're going to work on the Hill. And well, where'd yeah. you go? Well, I grew up in Texas and I went to Texas A&M, <laughs> which is an excellent school. It was then, yeah. even better now. Yeah, yeah. But I thought, okay, I, I really, I don't know how I ended up here, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to manage it here, but I, right. I, it worked out. Right, so, right. So yeah. I taught on the Georgetown faculty in their business school on the main campus right. for four years. Uh, and I really, the, the part I liked the most about Georgetown was the, the, the Jesuit priests. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever connected with them. 
They I were, did. They, they were really cool. Yeah, really great some people. of the best professors. Maybe the best professor I had, uh, Father Drynan, was uh -huh. a professor of probate, estate, wills, uh -huh. that sort of thing. And everyone got on a wait list. You wanted to take Drynan's third right. year you know, wills, trust, and estates class. And I did. And everyone graduated thinking they were going to become an estate lawyer because of how wow. good he was and wow. how good the class was. Wow. For sure. That's great. Now, now, what happened? What was life like after that? What would you do? You stay in D.C.? I, I actually moved to New York for a year okay. after that. I lived and worked in Manhattan. Like uh -huh. I said, I thought I wanted to be in politics. Right. I needed to get that out of my system. Yeah. So this is 2007. Uh -huh. There's a primary. There's an open seat, really. It was the first time, I think, in my lifetime, there was not a president or a vice president vying for a major party's nomination. That was the year that John McCain became uh -huh. the Republican nominee and yeah. Barack Obama was elected president. Yeah. So I worked on one of the major Republican campaigns in New York for about a year doing opposition research, speech writing, policy work, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and said, you know what, there are better ways to make $40,000 a year <laughs> right. than working 18 hours a day. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and we lost, obviously, right. uh, and it, it, it kind of told me that I needed to get back to reality sure. and may, maybe pursue some things that I had resisted uh -huh. throughout my you know formal education so that, that was kind of your 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 trial by fire that year in politics and campaign it, it, right? it very much yeah, you know yeah. i did not have a lot of work experience i had volunteered on a couple of races right, in texas right. but really pursued an opportunity on this campaign i, I that's what i wanted to do i believed in the candidate uh -huh. and i was studying for the bar here uh -huh. in houston at the time i think what got me the job was i took a weekend while studying for the bar i flew to new york I made a visit to their office on a Sunday afternoon wow. and met everyone. And I think they were just so impressed that I would take the time to do that that they, they gave me the job. So definitely persistence, going that extra mile wow. helps. Uh, I, I remember going, doing the interview, getting uh -huh. the job offer, asking them to wait until I had taken the bar exam to uh -huh. come up. And <laughs> they were uh -huh. you know, gracious enough to do that. Yeah. So I, I took the bar and then flew to New York and wow. had nowhere to stay, did not know anyone there, yeah. and just got started working. Wow. So you're in two cities that are a little bit far far away from Aggieland. I mean, pretty far. You know, yeah. I mean, East, you're, yeah. you're diving into the heart of the East Coast. It's, was, that, was that hard for you as a, as a tech growing, growing up as a Texan? Or? Yes, yes and no. I mean, I think uh -huh. each step of the way prepares you for the next thing. You know, leaving home and coming to AM is one thing. That was yeah. scary enough, you know, when you're young. Probably the most terrified I've ever been was when my, my parents, my sister, we all went up to Washington, moved me in, and it was kind of a fun summer trip, right? Yeah. We're all having a good time. Yeah. And then reality hits when they, they left. And yeah. I remember, I guess I was 22, 23, I don't remember how old I was. And I, I thought, they left me. <laughs> they left me here in Washington <laughs> by myself. What am I gonna do? Yeah, and yeah. that's probably the most scared I've ever been. And then uh, after uh, that, you know, Washington prepares you for New York. And after New York, right. you can really- you anything, you do anything. Yeah, nothing really scares you after <laughs> living in New York, for sure. So after that year, what, what happened after that? I guess jumping back to AM a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. You sure. know, the Aggie Network, I credit it with every yeah. successful venture I've had in business and in my career. You meet people along the way, and right. sometimes you meet people who meet people who help you out. And, and I don't know that that's the case. And this is this was my experience being uh -huh. an Aggie. Uh -huh. But really, every step of the way, it, ha it has gone to work for me. So when I was here, I, I had some friends, Erica and Monica Dean. Their dad had been very successful in oil and gas services here. Uh -huh built business after business. I met him once briefly, and then he visited Washington when I was in law school there. He had been uh, the CEO of a business that had been funded by Riverstone Carlisle when they had their joint fund. Uh -huh. And I believe Carlisle was based in Washington right, at that time. Right. He was there for some conference or something. He said, do you want to grab lunch? And this was 2005, probably. Okay. Okay. We had lunch, yeah. had a nice afternoon, yeah. didn't really see him again. and. When I moved back to Texas, I was just going to go back into private practice, uh -huh. work at a you know big firm, and he called me and said, "I think you should do something else. Uh -huh. I, I uh -huh. think you need to be in business. You don't need to be in private practice. Uh -huh. And if you'll come to work for me, I will I will teach you a business, and you will be able to live on that experience the rest of your life." Uh -huh. He's incredibly persuasive. His uh -huh. name is Randy Dean. Went to A and M uh -huh. uh -huh. for a time. Uh, he ended up finishing elsewhere for family reasons. Right, but right. he, all along the way, yeah. you, you meet people in life, sure, and sure. whether it's chance, coincidence, providence, whatever it is, at every step of the way, someone has entered my life and, and been a guide post to tell me 
this is what you need to do or let me help you get there. Right. And, and he has certainly been that in my career. I, I couldn't tell him no. I tried to tell him no multiple times. Uh -huh, uh -huh. He had a legal department at the company he was working at. I, yeah. I went and I uh, met with his senior attorney there. And he told me not to go to work there. <laughs> so we, we still laugh about that. Yeah. But I did. And I, so I went in-house very early in my career. Okay, okay. Learned a lot about a lot of different things, whether it was negotiating contracts, working with vendors, right. uh, regulatory compliance, right. employment law issues. It, the, the practice ran the whole spectrum. Yeah. It was a multi-state, you know, several hundred employee enterprise at that point. Okay. Okay. Went through multiple acquisitions. There was M&A work along the way. We, we became part of a public company, and so there was Sarbanes-Oxley oh. compliance. Oh. And I did that for about five years oh, after wow. I moved back to Texas. Wait, this was in Houston? Or this was in Houston. Okay, okay. And it's been bought and sold so many times, it, it right. doesn't, it's not even named the same company anymore. And it, but it's in oil and gas services? It, it is. It's a very niche uh, process called natural gas compression. Oh, I see. And so we would install these very large compressors. They're basically engines with frames uh -huh. on them. Uh -huh. They they take the, the gas from the natural gas stream out of the reservoir and uh -huh. either take it to pipeline spec to move it downstream to be sold, or they put it back into the formation right. in a process called gas lift. And what that does, basically, it, it raises oil to the surface. So oh, you're cool. using natural gas to, to extract the oil. Wow. So I, like I said, did that for about five years. Yeah, yeah. And then ended up back in Aggieland in 2012. Uh -huh, uh -huh. He called in late 2011, uh -huh. and he said, I'm starting a new business. He had retired, moved to Traditions. Okay, okay. I said, Tell me about it. <laughs> and he, he said, yeah, I'm going to, or I have been in the process over the last several months of contracting with cities and industrial wastewater plants across Texas. We're going to market this effluent to oil and gas producers for fracking. This was during the drought in 2011, 2012. Right, right. And I spent the next two years driving around to little cities all over Texas, working with city councils and city managers, uh -huh, uh -huh. negotiating for the rights to that wastewater. And then we were turning around and marketing it to oil and gas producers oh. in the Permian and the Eagle Fur. Interesting. Farm. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So, so they I, don't have to spend, they don't have to buy like, like clean right. water. Right. They're not using potable water. Right. So it's right. preserving right. it oh, for, for domestic use. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of creating a revenue stream for cities, which right. were hit by the recession at that point for as well. Sure, yeah. It's kind of a win-win-win. Yep. Yep. That's an interesting business model. Really great opportunity yeah. coming in from the beginning, yeah. Yeah. Uh, being like a founder in that deal, uh, working with municipal governments, going to the state legislature lobbying them for uh -huh. items and certain pieces of legislation during the sessions we were in business uh -huh. and, and then getting pro uh, projects off the ground you yeah, know we, we, yeah. we fracked a lot of wells oh yeah with yeah. some customers including pioneer and you wow. know big oil and gas producers so that wow. was a lot of fun and then two years in our engineering partner came to us and said we'd we'd like to buy the whole thing oh wow, wow. and we said the number's right, you know, we'll do that. So that's yeah. another thing. If you have a deal on the table, maybe you right. know, think long and hard about taking it. And we did. And the timing was really fortuitous because uh -huh. right after that happened, you know, oil, the price of oil and gas collapsed. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. oh, you timed it right. Right. So every, good timing is, is always and good. And when was this? This, uh... this uh, I started working there just, yeah. you know, as a hobby in 2011, right. came on full time in 2012, and then we sold in 2014. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, yeah. great, great. And so you were, that was when you came back to a to Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's, you, we've been here ever since? I've been here ever since. Yeah, we okay. started another venture and, you know. With the same, same person? Or say, same, same? We did, we got the old band back together one yeah. more time. Uh -huh, so we, uh -huh. we did gas compression again. Okay, And so okay. we ended up building, we, we went and got funding from Apollo. Uh -huh, they uh -huh. were our equity sponsor. And uh -huh. so in 2015, we started third party operations. So we went and we managed equipment owned by our customers. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We had this revenue stream, went to Apollo, recapped in the beginning of 2016. Right. And then kind of were on a, a four-year march at that point to exit. Okay. So they invested $200 million. Uh -huh. you know, we wow. had a credit facility. JP Morgan Chase led that. Yeah. And grew by acquisition, grew organically. Right. Ended up with about 250 employees across eight states. Wow. And so, you know, from... The original meeting at my kitchen table, and wow. I remember, you know, filing the the formation docs yeah. to, you know, one of the largest exits in that space in history to a uh, uh, fund out of Stockholm was pretty much a five year you know yeah. race to the finish. Th so th this also happened in College it Station. That, that's what's yeah. funny. Pegasus was here, yeah. probably the biggest business ever built in Bryan College Station, and no one no ever one's heard, heard of it. Of it. I can't it was it. It's, it's the best kind of success. It's so like. <laughs> You know, Secret, yeah. no one knows. So, yeah. So Pegasus was the first one, or what was? Or the, uh, the first one was called CDM. The, the okay. 2015 was Pegasus. 
2015 we, was Pegasus. And we okay. sold in 2019. I left in January of 2020, okay. right before the pandemic hit. So again, right, right. really, really good timing. Good timing. Okay, yeah. so Pegasus, uh, you had employees all over the U.S.? We did, and... yeah. We we started in Texas. Yeah, uh, yeah. We actually had operations in the Northeast, sort uh -huh. of what they call the Marcellus. So right. you get into issues of, we had people who lived and worked in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And yeah. so there's kind of this, you know, uh, yeah. uh, interesting pattern on the, on the, on the payroll reports. Sure. But, uh, there, we had employees up there. We had employees, of course, down here in Texas yeah. and New Mexico, Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. And then in the Mountain West, so Colorado, wow. Wyoming, like all over. I got to see parts of the country that I never really wow. thought. I How many were see. in the headquarters here? We had probably 30 or so in okay. GNA and mostly okay. here, but then we had field offices in Denver and other places okay, where got there it. were some people. Who wow. Worked, yeah. Wow. And um, you were at, you were the uh, the legal the, you weren't you weren't just the general counsel I guess right no I mean I I, I call myself the janitor because I, I get called <laughs> in to fix all the all the, uh, yeah. the problems yeah, which yeah. is one thing if you're thinking about being an attorney who's an entrepreneur you know right. who wants to own his own business right you are not going to get out of the legal work like if you have it on the wall they someone is going to come to you and yeah, say yeah, yeah. you you know you need right. it. and it's That's a nice right. skill to have yeah right? yeah of course uh, if you're not going to be an accountant you might as well be a lawyer it's right, second, right. second best right 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 right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I managed all the legal affairs of the company, uh -huh. like I said, regulatory compliance, yeah. uh, HR, uh -huh. uh, checked off every payroll report that went out every two weeks for years, right. with, made sure everyone was paid and you know, right. taken care of, uh, right. among a lot of other things. You know, yeah, my my yeah. favorite part is we were operating in West Virginia. Uh -huh. They knock on the gate one day, the state regulators do, and they yeah. say, you are a general contractor. Uh -huh. No, we're not. We're an oil and gas services provider. Right. No, you're a, you're a general contractor. Right. And why? Because you're turning wrenches when you connect your equipment to the, the pipeline. Yeah. yeah. So okay, what do we need to do? So uh -huh. you know, you call outside counsel in Charleston. You say, I'm. You know, is this really a thing? They look into it. They say, Yes, it is. Uh -huh. Someone is going to have to become a licensed general contractor in the state of West Virginia. So, you know, I flew up, I take the test, so yeah. I'm technically a, a general contractor in the state of West Virginia. You have to be prepared to do all I kinds see, of things. I see. Yeah, you never know what's going on. They're like, hey, hit. you pass the bar exam, you could You, you could, could you probably could pass do this. But there was math on that test. I will tell you, there's no math on the bar, but there was math. So oh, I, I sweated it out until oh, I got wow. my score. So, wow, that's yeah. great. And so after Pegasus, what uh, would you, what'd you do? Well, I sat at home for a year, yeah, like we all did, you know, right, that's during right, COVID. That's right. Yeah, well deserved. Uh, yeah, um, it, it's it's interesting. You know, I, I had a lot of plans. Yeah. When yeah. you sell a business, when you exit like that, yeah. And there's so much fanfare. You think, okay, my, my life is going to be different. I'm going to do this yeah. or that. Yeah. And it, I probably would have done a lot of those things, yeah. but when the world shuts down, yeah, right. It it makes you really stop and for, think about, okay, what 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 is the purpose of pursuing success, what are yeah. you really going to do with the rest yeah. of your life? You, yeah. you have a lot of like, sure. existential sure. moments. For sure, for sure. It was good. It was good and bad. Yeah. But I started working with a friend of mine here uh -huh. in Bryan College Station, uh -huh. a non-Aggie named Paul. Uh -huh. He has had, a, he's a brilliant guy, yeah. had a really great career in sports nutrition and consumer packaged goods, CPG. Okay. Totally okay. different than what, anything yeah. I'd ever done. I'd always yeah. been in B2B. He worked at Nutribolt for a long time, uh -huh. started uh -huh. his own brands. Uh -huh. And we had some mutual friends. He was kind of in the same spot I was, yeah. and they said, you guys should meet and chat, and we think yeah. you'd like each other. And so we did, and we did. And uh, I said, have you thought about doing this again or doing something ancillary to this space? He mm -hmm. said, oh, I've always wanted to do something, but you kind of have to have the hook. Mm -hmm. I said, well, one of the things that I had been doing in my off time was CrossFit. Oh, right, right. Which I don't look like it, but I was into like yeah. really into it. Yeah, and I said, yeah. This is a really untapped market, uh -huh. you know, in terms of like the TAMs of yeah. sports nutrition. This sure. is a group that's really never been marketed to. Uh -huh. And from that initial meeting, we got started probably in early 2020, right before the pandemic. Started reaching out to people, making calls, and ended up putting together a business uh -huh. that was. Uh, we launched September 1st. Uh -huh. Probably had one of the biggest launches in the history of that sector wow. online and went nationwide with GNC three weeks later. Wow. Signed up influencers, so we had Matt Fraser as a partner in the business. Uh -huh. He's the winningest CrossFit athlete of all time. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that movie, the Netflix. Show, right, right. Show, that's yeah. that's Matt. So yeah, yeah, Matt's yeah. part of it. And some yeah. other some other really uh, significant, talented influencers in the space. Wow. And so that was you know a, a really wild thing because yeah, I, yeah. I it was sort of a hobby something i liked i right. i got to meet a lot of people uh -huh. i had watched online and uh -huh. sort of 
liked what they were doing. Yeah. And it taught me that, okay, you can take skills from your experience and apply them to different different right. industries, different right. sectors. And so right. that, that was a real morale boost for everyone. It's like, okay, we, we can do this and we can be successful doing this. Wow. So. And that, uh, what happened with that company? Is that your? It's, it's still going. Still you know, going, yeah. fifty thousand followers on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. You know, sold out constantly. Great. Uh, I decided in the last few months. You know, Paul sort of took the reins, and uh -huh. he's been managing it. Uh -huh. And I decided to exit. It was the right time for me. Right. Just you looking at sort of my schedule and my commitments otherwise. And so it's been great. But yeah, they're they're doing great, and they're gonna they're gonna kill it. That's great. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Now, are you going to join another or start another company, do you think? Or I, you, you, what's funny is in the middle of Podium, I did start another one uh -huh, uh -huh. called Sago Capital. Uh -huh, it's, uh -huh. it's a little different. It's sort of a deal-by-deal yeah. deal thing. Right. So uh, Seth McKinney played football here at a and Yeah, yeah. Uh, his, his dad, Mike, was uh, chancellor right before right. Sharp. Right. He, uh, he's been in real estate for a long time, uh -huh. and so has Barry Moore, also uh, an Aggie alum. Uh -huh. we, we formed uh, an entity to go out and, and source deals, primarily in real estate, yeah. pool investors, sort of hold those, manage them, and then right. you know, sell them. And so we've been doing that. I've been flying all over the country looking oh. at properties. Industrial, oh, wow. Wow. so our thesis is class B industrial like everyone else. Okay. That's okay. grown as e-commerce has grown, and yeah. there's a big demand for it. Yeah. Uh, plenty of yield right now. Uh -huh. And then in the return to the office from COVID, we haven't looked at big complexes, but sort of small, especially single tenant boutique type offices, right, companies right. that are healthy, but would like the cash flow of getting out from under, you know, their, their mortgage of their office building. Right. Sell to us, we'll take it. You, you sign a long-term lease with us. We'll yeah. manage the property for you. You get the cash flow and everybody's happy. So that's sort of our, our two primary focuses are class B industrial and then boutique office. Okay. Okay. So, wow. And so that, that's that's your current your current. That career. is my current. So I'm I'm learning a lot about real estate law. That's yeah. the one area I've really never practiced in much. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like a complete idiot starting over. You know, 15 or 20 years in. Right. But I've uh, been taking a lot of CLE hours lately, <laughs> trying to learn about leases and. So you've had like a really I'm a very diverse career, right? In, incredibly in, diverse in, in all these different areas. Yeah. And that that's one of the takeaways for me when I look back on what I've done is people tend to pigeonhole themselves. Yeah. Oh, I've worked in this industry, whether as an employee or an entrepreneur for X number of years, how could I possibly ever right. you know, move, move beyond that or do anything else? And it's, it's pretty easy to move between industries. If you have a good skill set that's uh -huh. applicable, if you have good experience, uh -huh. if you have a good reputation, right. you can really pursue an interest in any number of, of fields or industries. Yeah. So you, you can't underestimate the value of a winning track record. Right. If you have right. a win, uh -huh. and you have a, especially a second win, uh -huh. and you have people who come along with you. Right. People tend to follow. Like they they will they will invest. They will come to work for you. They will take chances. That's really one of the things I, I saw, especially with Randy, who had worked in the industry for forty years, started multiple businesses. I see. He employed some of the same people. Oh, really? The entire time. Every time he started something, and I'm I'm one of those people who's a beneficiary of that yeah. that generosity. Yeah. He brought people along. So that's really my goal now is to to start new things, yeah. to invest in good people, uh -huh. and give people an opportunity like I had. Like I, you know, did not grow up incredibly well off. You know, very very middle class, yeah. and um, was able to really pursue the American dream. You know, one generation from my dad, right. and then me. You know, getting to graduate from Georgetown Law is right. pretty pretty that's big right. deal. It's only possible in America. So let me let me actually uh, drill down a little bit into each of your kind of your three industries. Yeah. So oil and gas compression, okay. guess, uh, uh, fitness new, uh, fitness drinks or nutrition, yeah, and then um, real your estate. last one on real estate, commercial <laughs> yeah. real estate. So uh, just you know, uh, just your thoughts, innovation in each of these spaces. Uh, what are your what are your ideas, opportunities in each of them? Sure. Um, Oil and gas is interesting, right? Yeah. It, we we always think the last bust is the last bust, and yeah. what we see is that it's come back. Clearly, we will move away from fossil fuels at some point. Right. There will be a transition over a long period of time, 30 to 50 years. So there, there's opportunity within that to invest in some ESG plays. Yeah. One of the, the guys who worked with us very early on at uh, Pegasus left the merged company once we sold, started his own gas compression company. This time he is working with electric driven motors rather than gas powered motors. So historically, in that space, we would just feed off the natural gas out of the out of the ground. That yeah. would fuel it. There's emissions. There's all kinds of issues with that. Uh, it's regulated, but nonetheless, yeah. you know, it's not as clean as yeah. it could be. Yeah. His engines are electric powered, and so they they don't emit anything. 
Right. That that's right. certainly something that someone has done that's mm -hmm. been successful in this space. So there'll be a lot of opportunities, whether it's renewables or ways to clean up traditional mm -hmm. fossil fuels. I think natural gas is, is sort of the future. You've mm -hmm. seen the price creep up. Yeah. It's much cleaner. It's much, much more plentiful than we thought. So oh, it, yeah. it is a, a nice bridge to you know, fully renewable energy at some point. So okay. I, I think if I were a young person, Maybe I wouldn't go get that petroleum engineering degree, uh -huh, but uh -huh. I would go get you know a, a business accounting degree or something, work in that space and right. look for a good opportunity. Especially a, a lot of big firms, Apollo is one of them. They've set up a fund, uh -huh. an entire practice for ESG in, right. in natural resources. Right, so right. There, there's definitely opportunities there. Okay. Uh, the CPG space is, or you know, fitness, yeah. I, consumer packaged goods. Yeah. I'll just talk about it broadly. Right. Lots of opportunity there. Right. I think we're sort of exiting this first era of influencer marketing uh -huh. with Apple coming in and asking you know apps not not to track. I think you've seen that in the valuations yeah. being pulled down in Meta yeah, and yeah. Google. There, there's a reckoning that's going to happen in that sure, space. Sure. They're either going to end up revenue sharing or they're going to find an in run around it. But but you know Apple stock has held, whereas everyone else. And, right. and it, I'm surprised there's not more talk about this. Like it is very clearly because Apple has said. You can no longer have access to this information. Right. We are the arbiters of right, all of this. Right. So it's, it's going to hurt some CPG companies mm -hmm. in direct marketing. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to get aggressive about retail, mm -hmm. uh, about going directly to influencers and having them feed through their channels where they have uh, you know, sort of a captive audience already. So there are some challenges there, but, mm -hmm. but I think when it comes to all natural, organic, um, renewable in terms of no, non-plastic packaging, the, the, there's a lot of opportunity in that space as well. Okay. For that. There's okay. certainly an ESG play there. Okay, okay. Yeah. And I would have thought that commercial real estate is dying because of the pandemic. You would but, think. But but you have a different story to tell? Um, yeah, I think the market yeah. is bearing out that it, it's it's not dying, it's thriving, but it's uh -huh. changing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so to, to our point earlier, are people going to come back to the office five days a week in high rises in downtown Dallas and Houston? Some firms will insist on that, and right. they'll have to do it. Right. And we'll see how that shakes out in terms of talent and resource placement. Right. Uh, I think we're very long on secondary markets. Uh -huh. Suburban office, exurb office, that, that's going to be the wave of the future. Mm -hmm. You're going to have people who are making lifestyle choices. They yeah. want more space. They want a home office. They're going right. to move to other places. Right. But they're going to want a place where they can gather together and meet when they need to. They're going to have a place where they can get out of the house when they need to go and have a quiet Zoom meeting. I think you're going to see a lot of flex space in office. So, uh -huh. small boutique office, single tenant, especially because you can kind of control who comes in and goes out yeah. until memories of COVID really fade. Yeah. I'm very bullish on that. Okay. Uh, okay. Big, big office complex. I think the jury's still out on that. Okay. Okay. When it comes to uh, industrial, your, your small, your last mile facilities, your infill, lots of opportunities there. Right. People are looking for space for fulfillment whether it's Amazon or other private companies, right, right. a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of competition right now to acquire those properties. Okay. Your, your giant industrial complexes, those actually haven't been hurt very much. Hmm. You know, your, your Amazons, your Walmarts, they, they're going to grow. They know it's sort of, we, we, we've pulled forward a lot of that transition in shopping, uh -huh. uh, 10 years probably, yeah. and so they're trying to catch up with that. Retail is a little different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think... You were obviously retail's not going away. Yeah. But even before the pandemic, you heard people talk about it being they wanted to be experiential, right? You you want to go and feel like you're you're having an experience. You're doing something. You're not just going to the store to right. pick something up. Right. Right. So you're going to see more mixed use outdoor type developments, like here at Century Square. Yeah. That's been a big hit. Yeah. Where yeah. in other developments, not as traditional yeah. retail malls are dying. We're going to have to find a use for malls. Right. I, right. I don't know what you know. The, the, the slabs don't necessarily support a lot of industrial. The ceilings aren't high enough to yeah. do fulfillment. So I, those may be scraped and okay, those sites okay. may be redeveloped. But otherwise, uh, I think you're going to see a lot of mixed use, very cool retail developments mm -hmm. that offer a lot of amenities to people. Do you have any projects in College Station? Oh. We, we we do uh, we don't do any development. Okay. We, we've uh, always acquired existing, so we yeah. actually have uh, an office building here, sort of meeting our criteria: single tenant, suburban office, uh, just off campus. Actually. Oh, okay, great. So, yeah, great, great. Well, student housing is always booming, right? So, 
It seems that way, doesn't it? <laughs> it never, yeah, I have friends who are in it, and it never stops. Yeah. And it's gotten so nice. Like yeah, I, I, yeah, when yeah. I was in school, they did not have the amenities that they yeah. do now. There were no, no such thing as a lazy river. Right. Apartment <laughs> so right we didn't right. have a pool, I don't think. That's right. That's yeah. funny. So, so let me ask you, um, let's kind of uh, dial back to your time at A&M. Okay. And so you're, you're different, I would say, than most lawyers who A&M yeah. produces. Or even so, I guess I said lawyers anywhere who are, who are generally either private practice or, right. or uh, in-house counsel. Uh, you've led a, a kind of a, a life of entrepreneurship. Um, I have. Can, can you tell us, I mean, imagine, like, first, what kind of a student would that appeal to? Maybe all of them. I mean, I don't know, you can tell me. And then what, 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 what advice or tips would you give to that person? I, th I think, I, I, as a lawyer, I can argue either way, right? Yeah, right <laughs> a very right, traditional right. or untraditional path. Yeah. I grew up with parents who were entrepreneurs, so right. I was kind of used to rolling with the punches uh -huh, of the uh -huh. economy and things were good or things were bad. Yeah. There is a lot of uncertainty in entrepreneurship. You have to have the personality type that allows you to go with the flow. Uh huh. You have to take charge, but you, you cannot be rigid in, yeah. in your thinking or your schedule or anything like that. If, if you want to have a very rigid schedule and experience, you, you should go join a big company. You know, you should go work for Exxon and get right. that experience. Right. That is a great career path. They're right. an excellent employer. They pay well. The right. training is excellent. And you can have an experience of moving between departments and, and roles. But it's going to be very nine to five. You're yeah. going to have a lot of bureaucracy to work through. Uh, so that, that sort of, you have to do a gut check up front and say, yeah. what kind of personality do I yeah. have? And would you say it's, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm simplifying too much, but among the population of lawyers, yeah. I would think of those, of that population, they're less likely to, to want, to be able to, uh, I mean, just based on their selection of jobs, right? right? They want the more, the more st steady income and stable I, I, hours. Yes, it right? is a very traditional path. And so right. I think there's a lot of self-selection there, people who, who want that stability, yeah. but also that's sort of what they teach. You know, they, uh -huh, they, they uh -huh. teach lawyers to be lawyers in big firms and that's who comes to campus to recruit and that's sort yeah. of the ideal yeah. this is what you do there's a very set path you're going to be on journal you're going to do a clinic right uh, you're going to try to do a federal judicial clerkship right which I did. I'm probably the only person to ever turned one down because <laughs> I got one and I just said I can't I, I can't do this right but um, yeah so that, that there's some self-selection there and then there's also sort right. of they, they train to that okay but not that doesn't mean that's how it has to be obviously right right, right. okay and then, um, so you you've uh, so you 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 need to be able to roll with the punches, you I do. guess, and, yeah. and yeah. handle the. How, how do you manage that? Are there any mental tricks or or? Uh, oh. <laughs> I may be the wrong person to ask about that. No, yeah. um, you you have to. One of the things I've had to learn that was yeah. not very easy for me early in my career, and I think for yeah. a lot of people, it's not personal. Uh huh. Uh huh. Whatever it is, it's not personal, and so you cannot let it ruin your day. Right. You cannot hold a grudge forever. Yeah. You, you've got to just manage the situation and move on. Yeah, and yeah. you never know who you're going to come back into contact with in your career. Yeah. You shouldn't be burning any bridges. Like there's, there's no successful entrepreneur who has gone scorched earth. It right. just doesn't. Right, that, right. that guy doesn't really exist out there. He yeah. exists in the movies or the yeah. sort of adaptations of yeah. lives, but yeah, yeah. Not, not in real life. It sounds from your story that your parents and your exposure to your parents have been your main source of, uh, I guess, inspiration in, yeah, in this, in this yeah. space. Uh, is that right? Or is it, have there been others? Or what would you say to people who maybe whose parents are not Whose parents are not entrepreneurs? I, you probably know some, maybe your friend's parents. Yeah. I, I would tell you to, whatever industry they're in, talk to a lot of people. Yeah. Sit down and say, what do you like about it? What do you not like about it? That was actually one of the things I did not do when I went to law school. Uh -huh. I didn't have any attorneys. You know, first generation Aggie, first generation attorney in my family. Right, right. I didn't know what I was getting into, and maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't have made a different choice, but it, yeah. it never hurts to make an informed decision. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. talk to a lot of people. Uh, if you live in a small town and there's been a successful entrepreneur there, it's shocking how willing people are to give you their time and attention. Uh -huh. Go and say, hey, I like what you've done. I respect the career you've had. Tell me about what you, you know, what you did and why you did it. Okay. And then even in the podium experience, something I learned is reaching out to very successful people, national figures. Right. There's all kinds of ways to reach people now, you know, whether it's through social media or otherwise. People are really receptive to talking to you about uh -huh. what, they, what they're doing, what they've done, how you can do it. Uh -huh. uh, I've seen that every step of the way. And, and don't be afraid to leverage the Aggie Network. You know, okay. if, you're, if you're a member of the association, you log on, right. you can search in all kinds of criteria, and there's lots of Aggies who are willing and able to help. Okay. 
Uh, one thing we're, uh, we're trying to do here at, the, at our center is to help students identify what they like to do and what they're good at. Um, I, I, just to dr 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 drill down on skills, um, yeah. tell me what skills as a lawyer have been useful to you in your innovation and entrepreneurship career? The, the single greatest skill that I have developed over time is the ability to write well and concisely. Uh -huh. Incredibly underappreciated, probably in business, but generally in society right. at this moment. Right. People don't know how to clearly communicate. They don't know how to articulate a message. They mm -hmm. just, I, and I watch people, whether you know, in public speaking or on the page, they just can't do it. It's very frustrating. So there may be some natural talent there, but I tell everyone, I didn't start out with uh -huh. the ability to, uh -huh. to write that. Like it, it came over years and years. Journalism was a great training ground. Right. All those classes I took, writing on a deadline, writing on a word count, you know, right. uh, great, great experience. And that helped a lot in law school. Like that was what set me apart. I was certainly not the brightest, not the best, uh -huh. but there were people who were very smart and they liked to talk in class and they would argue with the law, right? They would argue all these points. Like that's not what they're looking for in an exam. Uh -huh. They want, the professor wants to know that you understand the subject matter and you can apply it to this prompt. Right. If you can write clearly and concisely, you can make an A on every single exam in uh, law school. Uh. And so that, that is really undervalued, uh -huh. rare, I, I would say focus on writing and writing well. That's and that the single best thing you can do. High value in business, right? It has paid dividends for me. Okay. Yes. okay. People come to me not for legal advice. <laughs> can you help me draft this? Yeah. Even if it's not a legal document. Yeah. Um, now, back to your time at A&M, what mm -hmm. were some of the influences or lessons that were very useful to you in your career looking back? I'm trying to think of maybe some professors. Mm -hmm. um, I, I took a, a con law class in the political science department. Professor White was an adjunct. Yeah. And he, he taught that class like it was a law school first year con law class. There was recitation. He used the Socratic method. It was very challenging and terrifying, but right. that was, if you think you want to maybe become a lawyer or you know, work in business law, yeah. uh, there are classes like that here at Mays, I know. Uh, there are classes in other departments. Take one of those, see yeah. if you like it. See if it's something that you want to do for the next three years of your life. Right. Uh, so I, I would definitely do that. Uh, I worked actually at the Battalion, which at the oh, time was yeah. a much bigger publication. It printed daily. Uh -huh. At that time, had the largest number of readers of any student newspaper in the country. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's wow. About, I wish... you know, 25 pages a day, broadsheet. I wish that was still the case. I yeah. know. It's yeah. really unfortunate that it, yeah. it, it doesn't have that kind of reach it used to, but newspapers generally don't. Right, right. But that got me all kinds of opportunities. Huh. I got to cover speeches by dignitaries who would come in. I, I, I did one. Uh, Madeleine Albright spoke once mm -hmm. here. And then I met her years later, walking mm. down the street, uh, M Street in Georgetown. Oh, really? I, and I t we talked about that. I said, I, was right. your, I covered your speech. Right. She's living in Georgetown, right? Yeah. Right, I right. Know, and yeah. that was, you know, one of the coolest experiences I had in Washington was walking about ten blocks with the Secretary of State. Wow, so that's cool. Uh, that that was that was good. It was an opportunity to write as well and right. learning to write. And and you would get feedback. You know, people, oh, I read your article. It's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, publishing is great. Uh -huh. it, it never hurts to have that on your resume. I right. published in whether a general audience publication like the Battalion or some sort of specialty publication, right, business-oriented, right. whatever it is, right. I would encourage people to pursue those opportunities as well. Wow, that's great. And, um, and uh, your, your plans are to stay in Texas, to stay in this Aggieland? Is I, that right? I may be stuck here, yeah. <laughs> I, I moved my mom and dad up here late last year, uh -huh, and uh -huh, so uh -huh. I think I'm kind of stuck here for a bit. You know? <laughs> right, yeah, right. No, it's good. I love it here. I Did think... you expect to spend this much time at, <laughs> in no, Aggieland? No, I was probably voted the least likely to ever return. Yeah. When I graduated and left, it was very unceremonious. Like, we right. packed up, I right. knew where I was going, I had yeah, to get out of yeah. town. And just never thought that I would have the opportunity to come yeah. back. And that really wasn't the case until Randy called me. Right, uh, th right. There is sort of a burgeoning startup scene. It's uh -huh. very nascent here, uh -huh, uh -huh. But, but you can feel kind of something happening. Yeah. So I hope that it continues to develop and that there's an opportunity for students to stay here so we don't have right. a brain drain. Yeah, exactly. People, if right. you want to have a great lifestyle, if you want to be close to major metropolitan areas, there's really... Nowhere offers anything more That's right. for an Aggie than Bryan yeah. College Station. That's exactly right. That's right. So um, uh, one thing I want to, uh, when I look at your, the arc of your, your career, mm -hmm. it seems like this uh, the influence that Randy had mm -hmm. on you was existential. It kind of put you on this path. Yeah, he's then, really too much in my business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how could you recommend to students that they could have an experience like that that could really alter the trajectory of their lives 
uh, maybe it's as concrete as like, how do you make sense of the Aggie network? It's right. so big and diverse. How, how, what, what tips could you give to them? It, it does feel very nebulous, right? Just to yeah. say the words and what does that mean? And for a right. long time, I didn't really know what it meant until I looked back on it. Yeah. But it, it's making personal connections with people. Like if I hadn't befriended Erica and Monica, I never would have met their dad. Yeah. And, th and that, those were important friendships. You know, I'm still friends with them. I know their, their husbands and their kids. And uh, that has been very impactful for me. So I think making, meeting a lot of people, making yeah. a lot of connections, asking people who they know, and then just trying to reach out to people who aren't necessarily like you but have qualities you would like to emulate. Yeah. Randy walks into any room and he is confident and assertive yeah. and belongs there and he, yeah. he, he's tried to beat a lot of that into me and I'm uh -huh. much better than I was 15 years ago. <laughs> I was a really, really, really shy kid. Uh -huh. But you, you just find people who have qualities you like yeah. and you say, teach me what you know. Right. Because you, you'd be shocked how much of it is not innate. And people, yeah, people yeah. who are in their 40s and 50s have really sort of come into themselves. Right, right. And that mentorship yeah. is extremely valuable, right? Very, yeah, very. Yeah. yeah, people who have been wildly successful in life tend to have the resources and time to help you. So, right, right. you know, set your sights very high when you're looking for a mentor. Yeah. And, and you just, you meet people and you click. You know, you either have yeah. chemistry with someone or you don't. Yeah. And that's incredibly important. If you don't like spending time with someone and talking to them, they're not going to be a good mentor to you because you're not going to go to them when you have an issue or when you have a problem and you yeah. want to talk to them about it. That's right. That's right. You know, I wish I could be more concrete in that, uh -huh. but it's just a matter of personal developing personal relationships with yeah. lots of people and people who are, like you said, older than you. Right. Uh, that that's really important too right. at, at every stage of life. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's it's something I think we uh, when I was going through college, um, everyone was networking and talking mm -hmm. about networking mostly with their what peers. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and and I and you know I uh, I had my, my dissertation advisor when I was at, at Stanford. He um, he he was my my biggest mentor, and he was able to change my life in one email. Really, which is I asked him. This is how I got to DC. I was teaching at University of Chicago. And I asked, he was, he was the uh, President Bush's economic advisor. Okay. Um, okay. And I asked him, hey, can I join you? <laughs> and he just wrote back and said, sure. And it was that simple that, simple that he got me a job in the White House. I moved to D.C. I met my wife. I mean, my, it just totally That's, changed the trajectory yeah. of my life. So. Washington is a great place to do that. Yeah. If, <laughs> if you don't know what you want to do. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah. When, when I was there in That's the right. mid-2000s, right. W was president. Right, right. Everyone who lived in Washington was a Texan. Yep, at that point. Yep, it was a great exactly time right. to be from Texas that's Exactly right. That's right. So, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with spending a year or two in Washington. Yeah, yeah, Working for sure. on the Hill or an agency. For I, sure. I would say the Hill over the agency just because you... You probably get more in-depth experience in subject matter at yeah. an agency, but on the Hill, you just meet, you meet so many people. So many people. So many young all, people on the Hill. Yeah, right? yeah, from all over the country and the yeah. world, yeah. and there's so many things to do and see. That's exactly right. But that, that's actually, that was a formidable time for me. Right. And it was invaluable experience that's to right. have. So. I think that's another great lesson that you've, you've sort of, uh, let me say, you've crossed the Red River. So, yes. <laughs> and you, you've yeah. left Texas and you've had this experience outside of Texas, yeah. which I, I, I would encourage more students to do that. And so Very there was much, a, yeah. there's a, a, a Wayne Stark, I don't know if you know the name, he was um, uh, the former director of the MSC. Right, right. And he believed very, very passionately in this, um, that he, cre he endowed something called the Stark uh, Northeast Trip, which, which is okay. a fellowship for students, current students, to travel to the Northeast just to get that just exposure. Yeah. It, it's funny, it's, it's not just Texans. You know, I thought for a long time it was, but I, yeah. when I worked in New York, I met a lot of people who'd grown up on the East Coast. Uh -huh who had never been west of the Mississippi in their lives. Oh, right. And if they had, they'd been right. California. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, no, there's a lot of red states that you yeah, could you know, visit. Yeah, They're kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. But for sure, getting out and seeing the country, seeing the world, right. uh, that was great experience. Living in New York, understanding that there are people too, right? right. You know, cult <laughs> culturally different, but very, yeah. very cool. They're, they're making things happen. Yeah, they have yeah. a very different lifestyle yeah, in yeah. Washington than New York, than here. And yeah, I spent yeah. a summer actually at Stanford in law school. Uh -huh, I, I clerked uh -huh. there. You know, Silicon Valley, it, it's, it's very different. Yeah, very different. But yeah. you meet a lot of people in a lot of different industries. You learn a lot about how people live and why things are culturally and politically the way they are in the country. Right. It gives you great insight yeah. into people and how to sort of move through crowds. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you, Jeremy. This has been very, very interesting. You're, you've got a really cool and interesting career. And, and, I, and I believe there are a lot of lessons for our students. So, so thank you for taking the time here to talk about, about your life and times. And, sure. uh, and we look forward to staying in touch. Thank you, definitely.